Week 10 is upon us here in college football 2024. We got Bill Bender to break down uh, the games, the matchups with us. You can catch uh, Bill's work, of course, at Sporting News. Bill, good to see you today. Hey, thanks for having me on. Good to be on as always. Absolutely, it is. And um, with this uh, 12-team playoff, of course, this completely changes the scope of how we interpret these matchups in these games where Penn State uh, is looking at um, nailing a stake into that Big Ten championship game appearance in Indianapolis this Saturday. Uh, a loss would not be the end of the world, except for those people that are, um, you know, just wanting to pile on James Franklin some more, uh, where Ohio State with one loss would be staring at a second loss, certainly would not eliminate them, but put them in a must-win situation and take them out of the Big Ten championship game. And we could just go through all sorts of matchups that would just be viewed just entirely different uh, pre-2024. Yeah. Uh, the nature of the entire game has changed, right? Like, so it, last year we covered this game, and it was another example, like you said, Penn State couldn't win the big game, the top 10 game, and James Franklin's record in those is well-documented, uh, one and nine against Ohio State. Now they have this chance to – not only eliminate that narrative, but really take another step toward a Big Ten championship season. Uh, I think, you know, Mark, I, I'm trying to decide who has more pressure on them. You know, from that angle, there's the Penn State pressure. But I don't know if you can feel it, but around Ohio State, I can feel this pressure. It's palpable. You can feel it in this Nebraska game last week. And, you know, one win, and then all of a sudden they're on track to go to Indy. But a loss, then we're going to have to hear about Ryan Day's 2-6 and six then it would be two and seven in top five games. Um, I did look at a stat this morning. You know, he has the same record in top 10 games that Jim Trestle does. Nobody would guess that. You know, they were Jim Trestle was 10 and eight against top 10 teams. So is Ryan Day. It's just that Ryan Day has these matchups more frequently because I, even with more teams, the Big Ten's a little bit stronger. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, maybe I would have guessed that just because I think that, uh, in building these narratives, some people go out of their ways to conveniently direct us towards certain statistics, but not others. Right. Now, the stats don't lie. I understand that. But yes, if you broaden it out to top 10 games, then you're including a lot of Penn State matchups, a lot of Michigan matchups that uh, were not uh, included in that top five statistic for Ryan Day. But um yeah, both teams uh, come into this uh, playing relatively good defense. Uh, and Ohio State, of course, has this uh, huge issue along the offensive line that if it doesn't get corrected, uh, it, it's going to be difficult for them to mount drives. Maybe they'll just have to hit for big plays, and that will be the offense like it was against Nebraska. Uh, what, what are you looking for in this matchup? That's it. Offensive line. You know, they have to shuffle the offensive line again. You, you lose Josh Simmons, you go to a backup tackle. He may not play. You may have to move Donovan Jackson out to tackle, shuffle your guards, and the continuity isn't there. And, you know, Ryan Day was asked about that. I think I, I, I joked, you know, the first five questions in his press conference this week were about the offensive line and the running game. And he kept – he kept running the same play right back where he was talking about third down, you know, one and 10 on third down, one of 10 against Nebraska. And I looked, went back and looked at all the third downs. Well, six of them were third and five or more. So you can't say we're, most teams don't run the ball in third and five unless they try a surprise draw or something like that. They're going to throw the ball in those instances. So yeah, can you trust your offensive line on third down against Penn State? And they'll be coming. They have Abdul Carter. It's going to be loud. It would be louder if it was at night. And then for Penn State, you know, the drama is easy. It's, is Drew Aller going to be the quarterback? If Drew Aller's not the quarterback, I think they're going to have a hard time having any success. I, I know Bo, Bo Predbule is experienced, but a running quarterback against that Ohio State front seven, I, I think the Buckeyes will take their chances. I think some Penn State fans drew a little bit of hope from Prabula uh, delivering an 11 for 13 in the second half. Not that he was opening things up. He took a shot or two that I recall downfield that were unsuccessful, but uh, that he at least maintained the passing offense. And of course, Tyler Warren is a security blanket for either one of them. That could be a difficult matchup for an Ohio State linebacker or safety. Yeah. And, and Tyler Warren's the, the X Factor guy on Ohio or uh, Penn State's side. You know, he's 
can shield off defenders. They line him up in the backfield. They do some creative things when he's on the field. Uh, and he is a difference maker that they didn't have last year or didn't use last year. I mean, I mean, the big difference for me was Penn State. You know, you could sum up last year's game in a couple sentences. You could say Ohio State had Marvin Harrison, Penn State didn't. And is that going to be the same case this year where we, we leave the game say, well, Ohio State had Jeremiah Smith and Penn State did not. Penn State could not threaten vertically, challenge vertically, run the football consistent, consistently. And I thought the Ohio State defense got back on track last week. You know, that got lost. 13 tackles for loss, came up with some big turnovers, didn't have Lathan Ransom, still played well. I, I don't, but on the line, as you know, Mark, that this narrative with Jim Knowles in, in big games. And, you know, again, those offenses they faced were really good in some of these top five matchups. Um, so they're going to have to get after it against Penn State. Bill Bender stopped by to break down week 10 here at the Voice of College Football. Of course, catch Bill's work at the Sporting News. And you can see both Bill's X handle and also Sporting News right there. Uh, elsewhere in the Big Ten, we've got an Oregon-Michigan matchup that I'm trying to determine for one thing, how much Michigan's win against Michigan State really meant. Uh, it was a it was a struggle, and I don't know that this team's capable of dominating anyone. Uh, Michigan State, of course, is an improving team, and I have all sorts of respect for their head coach, Jonathan Smith, but it's just not a very good team overall if you're talking about contending teams. And so uh, I see a lot of people out there on the Michigan side that, that are touting this as some kind of a turnaround to the season but they won by a touchdown at home against Michigan State uh, versus Oregon playing probably the best football of anyone in the country. So the nuts and bolts of the matchup tell me that Oregon's decidedly better is shown by the point spread. Or am I going to fall into maybe a false or maybe a true narrative? We shall see on Saturday of whether Michigan's gamers, their championship, tough, minded guys, especially on the defensive side, will rise up and, and show some pride and stand up and maybe maybe be a bit challenged by, okay, we're the defending national champions. They're number one. We want to show that we we still have something in us. It's kitchen sink game. And I've kind of bit into it a little bit that I think they're going to compete in this game, especially if uh, Will Johnson's on the field. This would be the first. I know Oregon has done the cross-country thing once. They did that on a Friday night, but that was Purdue. This is Michigan. This is 100,000 people. It's a marquee game. It's getting the CBS treatment. Michigan offense showed a little creativity, but they still lack any real threat on the outside at receiver that's going to test Oregon. You, know, you can only throw to Colston Loveland so many times. And... um that's going to bite them in the end of this game. But I could see them competing into the fourth quarter and, and making it tough. But they need Will Johnson on the field to do that um, because he can, you know, theoretically not take out, but neutralize at least one of those receivers. Because I think what Oregon's going to try to do is exactly what they did to Oregon or uh, Illinois last week. Just knocked him out early. A couple deep passes. Dylan Gabriel's super efficient. Um, Michigan's going to have to get after him. And I could see it. I mean, Michigan State did it for a quarter, but then had some turnovers of their own and just couldn't get anything going offensively. So if you watch that Michigan State-Oregon game a couple weeks ago and then you flip it to the other side of the country, 31-17 makes sense to me. Yeah, that's pretty much right on the point spread. Now, if we look across college football, Bill, and we've had this discussion a few weeks ago, and as we narrow the field each week, it, it becomes a little bit clearer, a little bit more well-defined, but we're still far away from having a real grasp of scenarios, but it's still uh, in our wheelhouse to talk about scenarios and possibilities that uh, we're headed in the ACC toward a possible Miami, Clemson, SMU, all three are undefeated. Of course, SMU has to get past Pitt this week. And then in the SEC, there's all sorts of possibilities of all sorts of uh, log jams toward the top of the conference with no one undefeated. Well, Texas A&M undefeated at this point. And of course, they, they had a huge win against LSU that I was fascinated by that game. That game captured me on Saturday night, seeing Texas A&M completely flip the script out of nowhere where LSU only had a 10 point lead, but they could have had a 
21 point lead easily. They left so many points on the field where Texas A&M brings in Marcel Reed, take it from there. I guess where I'm leading you is that um, if we go the, the, the path of chalk that, that we have a, a certain scenario, but Texas A&M coming off a big win, going to South Carolina, where on occasion the Gamecocks have played nose to nose with some really good teams like Alabama and LSU that, that maybe, you know, we know that these games, these type upsets are waiting in the weeds and they're going to pop up at some point. You're going to do a really dangerous game this week. Texas A&M on the road, feeling good. Uh, Marcel Reed changed the dynamic of their offense in the second half last week. I, I Mark, I'm going to be honest. I, I penciled in LSU as a winner at halftime. They said, man, Garrett Nussmeyer's playing great. They've weathered the road thing. They're going to be fine. Marcel Reed changes the entire game. Now, I don't have a lot of upsets picked this weekend, but one I kind of have earmarked, like watch out, is AM going to South Carolina. At night, ABC Spotlight, Gamecocks had a week to prepare. I, I've covered games there before. It can be nasty to play there if you fall behind early, especially if they get that crowd behind it. It's a, it's one of those like unheralded tough places to play. I, I really believe that. And especially if South Carolina's got it going up their edge rush, and their offense is a little bit better. So that is a dangerous game. And I know, you know, we're sitting here lamenting all week that Ohio State and Penn State aren't playing at night, but this will be a good good night game for us to watch. And, and if AM wins, obviously gets through that, you start to think, okay, hey, they're going to be 10 and 1 when they play uh, Texas at the end of the year. And that might be the biggest game of rivalry weekend. So super excited for that matchup. And, and again, what Marcel Reed offers to that offense. They, I think, I don't know. He might play both quarterbacks. We'll see. Bill, as we look across the country, if, I guess if we stay in the ACC, uh, Clemson may not necessarily get a game against Louisville. It'll probably be a decent game. They've got a ton of firepower, but their defense is pretty bad. Uh, Clemson seems to be rather untested. I'm waiting for them to play somebody legitimate to find out exactly where they stand. Um, what other games across the country intrigue you this weekend well smu pit just because how, how much can smu continue to live on you know with their offense pit had a ton of turnovers i thought that game against syracuse would be much closer and, and they just blew open the doors early and, and often and, and played so well in that game so i think that's a, a game obviously with that acc log jam i i use the term the acc could get a little weird this weekend um, you know, obviously you mentioned Clemson, Louisville, Louisville has three, one score losses. So it's not like they're a bad team. You know, Miami plays Duke and, and there's some, the Manny Diaz factors at work there. Duke's testy. They're not an easy win. They, they could have easily beat SMU last year. So what if we get it to the end of the day? And that scenario you presented is very real that if Miami can get through this one and if Clemson gets through this one, which I think they will, they're at home. And then SMU finds a way against Pitt. That scenario is going to get louder. That hey, these three might, you know, what what do you do? What what are we doing in a conference where we we can't play each other? And it's so funny to me. And I don't know where you stood on this over the years, but it, it does call for a need to have divisions when your conferences are this large. Which is so ironic because we spent so many years fighting against the notion that we needed them. Yeah, the obvious flaw to the division system is that. Mm -hmm. You've got the best team in the conference playing. Look at How any many, year in the big. Look at yeah, any year in the Big yeah, Ten West exactly. Division, the fourth best team in the conference. Well, that that's the flaw. But at least you have a decisive way to determine the division. Like I had to weed through years and years, Bill, of conference championship play to find three way ties in divisions. There's only been a few. So basically, you got the team with the best record goes, and if two teams have the same record, they played. So there you go, and you've got a clear cut. But can you imagine? If Clemson, let's say, would beat Miami in, a, in an ACC championship game and give Miami its first loss and SMU sitting at home at 11-1 and one with a three-point loss against a BYU team that's ranked in the top 10, do you give three bids to the ACC? That's going to be a big question. And who do you sacrifice as a result? Because, you know, one of the taste test questions. So you present your scenario. And, uh, and let's just pretend that Indiana is sitting at home on the same weekend and they acquit themselves well. They lose in Ohio, at Ohio State, but they play well. Like it's a 
kind of like they did in 2020. It's that type of game. Um, you know, they'd lose by a touchdown. So they're sitting there. And then Colorado's sitting there, or Alabama's sitting there, and they're 10 and 2. And Colorado's sitting there with all of the things that they presented, but they haven't beat a ranked team. The, and these are the last two or three teams that get in the playoff. Who do you leave out? And I have was on a show yesterday. I was telling the host, this is going to be so much more emotional than the NCAA men's bat. Everybody loves comparing this to basketball. I don't even think it's close because how much time did you really spend being angry about Indiana State being left out of the tournament last year other than the fact that they had Robbie Avila? Uh, how much time did we spend on St. John's and being angry? Not much. The, the, the impact of leaving somebody out of this will last the entire calendar year. You're going to have a Florida State situation every single season. And especially, again, just to go back to this SMU situation, this could just be fascinating because, number one, their loss to BYU. No, it wasn't the typical 7-6 and six BYU team. This could be an 11-1, and 12-0, 13-0, 12-1 BYU team. On top of that, to me, it's a little bit more tolerable when a team gets left out of a conference championship game, even though I don't think it's the best situation. But let's say there's a six and two, three way tie atop the ACC and three teams are six and two. That's a little more tolerable than they went undefeated. What else could they have done? They, they can't control the schedule they were given. All right. And Pitt's another team that's interesting. Yeah. Where they could, they could split those games with SMU and Miami and, Still sit home theoretically, and and then you get in an even larger mess with that. Um, I know. I think we talked about the potential five way tie in the Big Ten. It's it's more down to three or four now. You know where I think you've got four serious contenders for the playoff out of the Big Ten. But you know what happens to Ohio State if they lose this weekend? What are they hanging their hat on? A victory against Indiana, like that's not going to impress the committee as much as we think. So, and the worst thing for them, as much as Ohio State fans like to root against Michigan, is probably need Michigan to show up at least down the stretch here and not be a, at that point, what are we looking at, six and five potentially, right? Like they, that's not going to do much for their resume because we know Michigan is not what they have been in past seasons this year. Quite frankly, their their offense is embarrassing. So, I mean, these are things that the committee, the committee, the four team was very straightforward to me. And one thing I said this week was we had 13 teams entering week 10 last year that had one loss or less in the power four. So we were basically 13 teams were playing for four spots. You take away the group of five right now, include Notre Dame. You have 25 power conference schools plus Notre Dame competing for 11 and 11 spots. And I think it's infinitely more entertaining in some ways, but at the other, on the other hand, some teams are going to be left out that feel like they should be in. It's probably going to be more. Uh, anything in particular, Bill, that you would like uh, to make people aware of that you're working on this week? No. I mean, I feel like I could talk to you about this stuff forever. And you, you're very well informed on everything, too. And and you've got I know you have the stats to back all this up as well. So, you know, I'm just looking forward to talking to you over the next couple of weeks. We've got some Penn State, Ohio State stuff. Uh, we have a piece up right now about Ohio State and and the perception of the or versus the reality of what their problems really are right now. And it really focuses on the offensive line. I will say this, I'll ask you this real quick. Um, I think Will Howard's playing well. I, I think the defense is fine. And I just think there's a little bit more pressure than there needs to be on this team because there are outs, you know, you go in on Saturday and then you're, you're sitting pretty for Indianapolis. Yeah, for all the angst surrounding Ohio State uh, football and uh, the sky is falling mentality of a lot of fans, they're six and one. They have a <laughs> one point loss on the road to the number one team in the country, a game in which they had the ball in field goal range to win the game. Right. So if you lay out that scenario in July, people are like, oh, OK, that's about what we expected. Yeah, enjoy life a little bit, man. You got a good <laughs> exactly. program with a good team, and you're probably going to be in the playoffs. So, yeah, but, I, you know, like I said, I always appreciate coming on with you. This was a lot of fun.